My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am pleased to introduce our guest this evening, Peter Beinart. If you've attended our events, you know that the Middle East, more specifically Israel, has been a topic that we've featured, um, a topic we've featured a number of writers discussing. Everyone from Tariq Ramadan to Michael Oren, Syed Kashua, David Grossman, and Dennis Ross, to name more than a few. Given the recent conflation of social justice movements with anti-Israel sentiment on college campuses and the slow motion riot playing out in Israel today, it seemed a useful time to invite our guest. Peter Beinart is currently Associate Professor of Journalism and Political Science at the City University of New York. He is also a contributor to The Atlantic, a senior columnist at Haaretz, and a senior fellow at the New America Foundation. Beinart graduated from Yale University, winning a Rhodes Scholarship for graduate study at Oxford University. After graduating, he became the New Republic's managing editor in 1995 and ultimately served as the magazine's editor from 1999 to 2006. He is the author of three books, including The Good Fight, The Icarus, Synd the Icarus Syndrome, and most recently, The Crisis of Zionism, the topic which he'll discuss this evening. Please join me in welcoming Peter Beinart to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, thanks very much. It's really a, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I know this is a, a controversial subject, uh, the relationship between American Jews and Israel. After my book came out a few years ago, a friend asked me, have there been any angry words, personal denunciations, ad hominem attacks? I said, you mean outside of my own family? <laughs> Yeah, there have been a few. My wife sent out an email of the kind that spouses sometimes do. She said, you can agree or disagree with Peter's argument, but we're very proud that he wrote a book. <laughs> so she got an email back. The person said, I would never buy that book. I think Peter's a threat to the Jewish people. I wouldn't give him a dime. So my wife forwarded on the email, and she said, who was that? They seemed so angry. And I said, don't you remember? That's my cousin David. I haven't heard from him in years. My mother said it was a good thing that my grandmother didn't know how to blog. Um, so let me start by explaining why I believe that Israel's creation has been such a blessing for the Jewish people. First, it's been a blessing because we now have what we did not have in the 1940s when our people were being led to the slaughter, a country whose mission statement is the protection of Jewish life. Some younger American Jews may take that for granted. I don't. I still remember watching a Jewish state send airplanes to pick up the Jews of Ethiopia, one of the poorest and most reviled communities on earth, and return them to be with the people from whom they had been estranged since the days when the temple stood. Second, Israel has been a blessing because thanks to the Zionist movement, we have a Jewish state as a cultural center for Jews around the world, based upon the revival of Hebrew as a living language. And with all the problems that we have maintaining diaspora Jewish life, one can only imagine how much harder they would be if we did not have Israel and modern Hebrew to anchor us. But these inspiring accomplishments, I believe, are being put at risk by Israeli settlement of the West Bank and the resulting threat to Israel's character as a democratic Jewish state. Democracy is not the whole of the Zionist dream. Israel is not, in my opinion, should not be a secular democracy just like the United States. It should have, as I argue in my book, a special obligation to the Jewish people. But if democracy is not the entirety of the Zionist dream, it is necessary to the Zionist dream. Theodore Herzl understood this. His 1902 novel, Antnalant, is largely about an election in an imagined Jewish state. In a, 
between one candidate whose party includes Arabs and supports the right of Arabs to vote and another party that wants to restrict the right to vote to Jews alone. And in his novel, Herzl has one of the candidates who believes in democracy tell the people of this imagined Jewish state, quote, you must hold fast to liberality, tolerance, and love of mankind. Only then is Zion truly Zion, unquote. Israel's founders understood this. In 1948, three years after the Holocaust, with the stench of Jewish death still hanging over Europe, with Israel for a war, in a war for its very survival against its Arab neighbors and fielding a ragtag army composed in significant measure of people with numbers tattooed on their arms, Israel's founders wrote a declaration of independence that promised, quote, complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of race, religion, or sex. For me, that democratic vision is crucial to the miracle that is the Jewish return to sovereignty in the land of Israel, and it's a big part of the reason an Israeli flag hangs in my two children's room. But that miracle is today imperiled by Israel's control of the West Bank, where, in flagrant violation of the principles of Israel's Declaration of Independence, Jews carry identity cards with blue covers that give them citizenship, the right to vote, the right to due process, and the right to be waved through checkpoints. West Bank Palestinians, by contrast, carry identity cards with green or orange covers that deny them citizenship in the country in which they live, deny them the right to vote for the government that controls their lives, and severely restricts their travel. Those cards place them under the jurisdiction of military courts, where evidence is largely secret, where people can be held for months or even years without trial, and where, according to a report by the United States State Department, 99% of those tried in 2013 were convicted. Among the crimes for which West Bank Palestinians can be convicted is Military Order 101, which makes it a crime for 10 or more people to assemble without permission for a political purpose, even if they are assembling peacefully, even if they are assembling in someone's home. This is not to say that Jews who live in the West Bank are bad people. They're not bad people. They're mostly people who moved to the West Bank because the Israeli government made it cheaper for them to live there. And it's not to say that Jews should not be able to live in the West Bank, the place where, according to Jewish tradition, our patriarchs and matriarchs are laid to rest. I believe Jews should be able to live in the West Bank, either as equal citizens in land annexed to Israel in a peace agreement or as equal citizens in a Palestinian state. The problem is not that Jews live in the West Bank. It's that today the West Bank is a place where, contrary to the vision of Israel's founders, citizenship is ethnically based, where Jews and Palestinians live under a different law. And as Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, warned, if Israel makes permanent its occupation of the West Bank, it will be forced to choose between its Jewish and democratic characters. It will invite Palestinians into a one-state struggle that Israel cannot win because its efforts to maintain itself as a non-democratic Jewish state will make it a pariah in the world. This is what former Israeli Prime Ministers Ehud Barak and Ehud, Ehud Olmert meant when they both warned in recent years of a potential apartheid future and a South Africa-style struggle for the character of the one state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. It's what former Israeli Justice Minister Tzipi Livni meant when she warned that, quote, the existence of Israel as a democratic Jewish state is in mortal danger, unquote. I want to be clear. I believe the Palestinians do bear some of the blame for the failure to achieve the two-state solution that would allow Israel to remain a democratic Jewish state. The Palestinians have undermined their cause through the terrorism that I call in my book grotesque. And tragically and inexcusably, we see examples of that terrorism almost every day. There is a troubling Palestinian tendency to deny the historic connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. 
And, as I say in my book, there are real questions about whether Palestinian leaders will make the compromises, especially on the right of refugee return, necessary for a two-state solution to come to pass. But even if I conceded every nasty thing that anyone could possibly say about the Palestinians, it is not the Palestinians who are essentially paying Israelis to move into the West Bank. In 2012, a report in the business supplement of the Israeli newspaper Yedir Akhronot noted that the settlements received 70% more money, government money per person, than do cities and towns inside Israel proper. In 2012, Israel's then finance minister boasted that during Benjamin Netanyahu's time as prime minister, the portion of Israel's budget going to the settlements had doubled, which helps to explain why in 2013, Housing growth increased 5% in Israel proper and 130% in settlements in the West Bank. So it's not enough to say that Israel will get a handle on settlement growth when the Palestinians finally decide to live in peace in a two-state solution. Because by supporting settlement growth, you're pushing Palestinians in exactly the direction we don't want them to go. Every time Israel subsidizes more Israelis to move to the West Bank, we make those Palestinian leaders who will reluctantly, I underscore reluctantly, accept Israel's right to exist and who are today cooperating against terrorism. We make them look like fools. And every time Israel makes it harder to build a viable Palestinian state, we make Hezbollah and Hamas stronger. We don't know whether Palestinians will ultimately make the concessions, especially on refugee return, necessary to allow a two-state solution to come to pass. But we can be darn sure they won't make those concessions if they won't even get a viable Palestinian state in return. So even if you don't believe that a Palestinian state is possible tomorrow, you have, in my opinion, an obligation to try to stop the settlement subsidies that will soon foreclose the possibility of a Palestinian state ever. Because when you destroy the two-state solution, you give Israel's enemies the capacity to do politically what they have been unable to do, thank God, militarily, destroy Israel as a Jewish state. Zionism, at its core, is about giving Jews control over our own destiny. Settlement growth threatens the core of the Zionist dream because it takes that destiny out of Jewish hands. All of which, I think, raises a question for those of us here in the United States. In the face of this crisis of Israeli democracy, this crisis of Zionism, why are American Jewish leaders so silent? I'll give you the answers that American Jewish leaders offer, and then I'll suggest an answer of my own. The first answer that American Jewish leaders give is that it is not their place to criticize Israeli policy, since American Jews don't live in Israel and thus don't bear the consequences of the policies we propose. Yet those same American Jewish leaders don't live among the Palestinians either, yet they criticize Palestinian actions all the time. Nor do American Jewish leaders live in Europe, and yet they repeatedly criticize European governments, usually for their policies towards Israel. And American Jewish leaders didn't live in the former Soviet Union. Yet I remember when I was in high school, they moved heaven and earth when the Soviets were oppressing their Jewish population. And American Jewish leaders don't live in Syria or Iran, and yet they speak out passionately about the crimes occurring there. In truth, I think, American Jews have a very proud history of speaking out morally about things that happen in countries in which we do not live. So why exclude the foreign country, Israel, about which we care the most? Secondly, American Jewish organizations sometimes claim that they can't criticize Israeli settlement policy because a Palestinian state might imperil Israeli security. As it happens, that position puts them at odds with the vast majority of Israel's former top security officials, since every former head of the Mossad and Shin Bet Israel's external and internal security services who have publicly spoken in recent years, and every former head of the Israeli military except one publicly favors a Palestinian state near 
the 1967 lines. But even if you think those security officials are wrong, and that Israel needs to maintain military control over the West Bank for security reasons, that still doesn't justify paying Israeli civilians to move into the West Bank. After all, if the Arab countries were to invade Israel again, having remote civilian settlements scattered throughout the West Bank would be a security nightmare for the Israel Defense Forces. So even on their own terms, I think, the arguments that American Jewish organizations offer for their silence don't make much sense. The real answer, I believe, the real reason for this silence goes deeper. It has to do with the way that American Jewish leaders describe the Jewish condition. The only kind of threats to Israel that American Jewish leaders generally feel comfortable publicly discussing are threats from outside. For instance, the threat from global anti-Semitism or the threat from Iran. There are such threats. I'm glad they're discussed. They need to be combated. But I think the reason that American Jewish organizations feel comfortable publicly discussing only these external threats is because doing so fits into the familiar narrative of Jews as a weak, menaced, and reviled people. At the core of the American Jewish community's unwillingness to confront the internal threats to Israel's democratic character lies the American Jewish community's unwillingness to accept that although we still face threats from without, that today the Jewish condition has changed. The unwillingness to recognize that today some of our deepest challenges stem not from our weakness, but from our power. Consider the way that American Jews discuss our holidays. You know, there's a joke that every Jewish holiday has the same plot. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. <laughs> and there's a reason that American Jews laugh at that joke. It's because so often that's the way we tell the story of our holidays. So you ask many American Jews about, about the holiday of Purim coming up next week, which is my, daughter's, my eight-year-old daughter's favorite holiday because it combines two of the things that she loves most in the world, pastries and dress up. <laughs> and they'll say, oh, sure, I know the story of Purim. Uh, Haman tried to kill the Jews of Persia, but Esther and Mordechai saved them. And well, then the story's over and we eat our hamantaschen, which are really delicious. But that's not the way the book of Esther ends. It doesn't end with Jewish survival. It ends with the Persian king Ahasuerus giving Mordechai the right to take revenge upon Haman's people and the Jews killing 75,000 souls. It ends, in other words, not with survival, but with power, with a troubling act of Jewish power, an act about which our tradition has much to say, yet we rarely talk about that. Or consider the way that American Jews discuss Hanukkah, which is my son's favorite holiday, because it, begin, it brings together two of the things that he loves most in the world, warfare and presents. Well, a couple years ago, we had a bit of a family crisis because a rabbi at my son's Jewish day school told him that when the Mashiach comes, when the Messiah comes, there will be no more war. He was devastated. <laughs> we tried to convince him that as far as we knew, this was not imminent. <laughs> About Hanukkah, we say the Syrian Greeks wouldn't let us practice Judaism, but the Maccabees rose up, and they defeated them, and they rededicated the temple, and the oil lasted for eight days, which was a miracle. And, well, then we eat our latkes, which are delicious. But why do we stop the story there? The Maccabees became the Chazmanian dynasty the last experiment in Jewish sovereignty before our own time. It was a very troubled experience. That's one of the reasons the rabbis of the Talmud didn't like Hanukkah very much, because they knew what the Hasmonean dynasty had become once Jews took power. But we don't talk about that, I believe, for the same reason we don't talk about the internal threats to Israel's democratic future, because we don't talk about the ethical responsibilities of Jewish power. And it is this failure to talk about Jewish power, to engage with what our tradition has to say about what comes after victimhood and survival, that helps explain why so many young American Jewish kids feel so alienated from our community's discussion about Israel. 
It's because those kids, more than their parents and grandparents, are growing up with power and privilege in the United States. And they see Israel as a regional superpower in the Middle East. And so it is precisely what our tradition has to say about Jewish power that could be most relevant to them if we ever talked about it. I think we need to tell young American Jews that as the generation growing up in an age of unprecedented Jewish power, they have been tasked by Jewish history with a very special obligation. During our long night of powerlessness, Jews spun visions of dignity and justice that inspired the world. But only now, in this age, can we learn the true meaning of those ethical visions. Because of the Jewish tradition of justice forged in powerlessness, cannot survive the confrontation with Jewish power. If it cannot inform the actions of a Jewish state, then in retrospect, what good was it? We need to tell young American Jews that this Jewish state is their birthright, their patrimony. It was won at a cost in blood and suffering that they can scare, scarcely even imagine. And it was not born to be another Chasmonean dynasty. It was born to live the Enlightenment ideals that Europe had betrayed. We should tell young American Jews that if that kind of Jewish state dies, it will be a stain upon their lives. That Israel's collapse as a democratic project will have as profound an impact on their experience as Jews as Israel's creation had for their parents and grandparents. We should tell them that in the 1960s, the best of their parents' generation could have been found in places like Alabama and Mississippi when American democracy was in its moment of crucible, and that they need to find a way of being involved in the struggle for Israeli democracy, because although Israel may not be their country, the Jewish people are their people, and their fate is thus intertwined with the fate of that small nation half a world away. People sometimes ask me about the conversations I have with folks like my cousin David, who don't much like what I write about Israel. But in truth, those aren't the conversations I worry about. The conversations I worry about are the ones I'll have one day with my 10-year-old son and my 8-year-old daughter if we, on our watch, our generation lets the dream of a democratic Jewish state die. I don't want to have those conversations. I want Ezra and Naomi to one day put up the flag of a democratic Jewish state in their own children's room. That, in my opinion, is the great Jewish struggle of our time. Thanks very much. Thank you for that powerful and well-reasoned uh, set of remarks. I'd like to ask you to address two quick things. One, one shibboleth that is always thrown at you, I'm sure, is that you need an honest interlocutor on the other side to make peace, and that repeatedly it has been demonstrated that it doesn't exist uh, from the three no's through Arafat, with Camp David with Clinton and so forth. That's one thing. Right. And could you also suggest some confidence building measures? That's an old diplomatic phrase that we used to hear right. from Henry Kissinger. Suggest some that might realistically work going forward from now that might lead to what you're talking about. Um, thanks. So those are, those are really good questions. Um, so I, I don't have time to address the entire history of what's often called Palestinian or Arab rejectionism. Um, and um, there has been Palestinian or Arab rejectionism. Uh, um, I talk about it in my book. I think, for instance, that um, Yasser Arafat made a decision um, in 2000. I wouldn't say he was the instigator of the Second Intifada, but he allowed the Second It was really created by a younger generation of Tanzim in, uh, underneath him, but he essentially allowed it. He didn't try to stop it in the very, very reckless belief that perhaps that out of this violence there might come greater Israeli uh, concessions. That was a, uh, a tragic, disastrous, immoral decision that led to tremendous suffering, not only for uh, Israelis, but also for Palestinians. So I'm not here, uh, as I hope I conveyed in my s speech, and I think you would find if you read my book, to defend all of the Palestinian decisions. 
Um, but when it comes to Mahmoud Abbas, I, I think I can say this with some degree of confidence. Israeli leaders who themselves do not support a Palestinian state near the 1967 lines, and I include in that Benjamin Netanyahu, because although Benjamin Netanyahu said in 2009 that he supports a Palestinian state, he has said that he does not support the 67 lines as the parameter for that state. That puts him in a different category than Ehud Barak and Ehud Omer. That Palestinian leaders, that Israeli leaders like that, who don't support the kind of Palestinian state that Bill Clinton envisaged in his famous Clinton parameters in December 2000, they also tend to say that Mahmoud Abbas does not support such a state, would never accept it. But if you look at Israeli leaders who themselves actually support such a state, they tend to believe that Abbas does. So one example is Shimon Peres, Israel's long, long time president, who said in 2014, quote, that Abbas was the best partner that Israel has and the best we have had. I've known him for 20 years and he's a man of his words and of courage. We shouldn't miss an opportunity to make peace with him. Another such Israeli leader is Ehud Omer, who negotiated at great length with Abbas in 2007 and 2008, and who wrote in 2011 that, quote, Israel will not always find itself sitting across the table from Palestinian leaders like Mr. Abbas and Prime Minister Salam Fayyad, who object to terrorism and want peace. Now, I could go into mind-numbing detail about what happened in 2000, 2001 in the Arafat Barak negotiations, and again, uh, uh, in the um, in the Omer negoti uh, Abbas negotiations of 2007 2008, but I, I, I would just for here for, for now say this: the typical American Jewish establishment depiction of this is that Israel gave the Palestinians everything that they could have conceivably wanted, and the Palestinians said no. The reality, and we now have a lot of a lot of documentary evidence, a lot of books that have written, including by Israeli negotiators and by historians, suggests that this was much more like a, a situation in which. The Israelis said, to, we'd like to buy your house for $500,000. And the Palestinians said, no, I'm only willing to sell it for a million dollars. Which is to say, there was a gap between the two sides' positions on a whole range of issues. So to give an example, on um, Barack in his famous summer of 2000 offer at Camp David. There's a debate about what the offer was because it was not written down. It was conveyed orally through the Americans. But it seems to have been something along the lines of Israel would annex 9% of the West Bank, trade the Palestinians 1% in return, and retain control over the Jordan Valley, which is another roughly 25% of the West Bank for 12 years. Uh, the Palestinians did not, did not accept that. The Palestinian offer was for Israel to annex about 2.5% of the West Bank, a little bit less, and give, re compensate the Palestinians with an equal amount of land inside the Green Line. My point is not f at this f right here to suggest which offer is better. My point is there was simply a difference. Um, there was also a difference on Jerusalem, in which Barak was allowed to allowed, willing to allow the Palestinians to have a capital in the outer-lying Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, but not the inner Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem. And Arafat wanted a capital in all of Palestinian Jerusalem, including Palestinian control over the Temple Mount. There was a debate about refugees. Some of the Israeli negotiators at, at Camp David believe that if Arafat had gotten what he wanted on Jerusalem, he would have ex consented to what was essentially a symbolic or small-scale Palestinian return of refugees. Other Israeli negotiators didn't believe he would compromise. If you look at Omer and Abbas, you see a fairly similar dynamic. So Omer went further than, uh, uh, than Barak did. He offered he wanted to annex 6.3% of the West Bank and trade 5.7% in return. This was the best Israeli offer the Israelis have ever made. The Palestinians wanted about a 1.9% land swap. Why is this gap? The Israelis always want to annex 6, 8, even 10% of the West Bank. Why? Because they're trying to annex about 80% or more of the settlers. Barack was on record as saying that if he didn't believe he could annex that many settlers, he believed there could be civil war, that what happened to Yitzhak Rabin could happen to him. The reason the Palestinians didn't want an annexation of such a great, of so large, was two reasons. First of all, they believed that Israel could never compensate them for that much land, which is to say there's not enough good arable land with no people on it inside the green line that you can trade for a 6 or 7 or 8 percent annexation. The second reason is that Israel wanted to annex, as part of that 6 or 7 or 8 percent, settlements like Ariel. So Ariel is the fourth largest settlement. Um, if you look at a map, 
It's often described as a consensus settlement by Israelis, one that Israel would obviously need to keep. But if you look at a map, what you'll find is that Ariel stretches deep into the northern West Bank, almost halfway across the West Bank. So that from a Palestinian perspective, if you're a Palestinian in a city like Tur uh, Kalkilia or Turkolam, uh, Turkolam or Kalkilia, which are on the northern side of the West Bank, but right next to the Green Line, it basically cuts off contiguity between those cities and the rest of the West Bank, which is why the Palestinians would not accept Ariel. Ariel was a big sticking point between Abbas and Omer. Uh, on refugees, about according to the, the, what, we, what we've seen reported, including the leaks that came out of uh, the WikiLeaks, um, Omer said that he could accept 10 or 20,000 refugees. Um, Abbas privately offered, uh, asked Israel to accept 150,000. So that was a pretty significant gap. But I just think it's worth noting that that is not the same as saying that Israel offered the Palestinians everything and the Palestinians made no concessions. In fact, for the Palestinians to say, we only expect Israel to take 150,000 refugees um, rather than millions, is from the Palestinian perspective a massive, massive concession. And if you want to talk about demography, and I'm not a big fan of these demographic number arguments, but Israel would actually, if Israel gives away the Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem and takes 150,000 Palestinian refugees, it actually has a higher Jewish percentage of its population than it does before it makes that deal. So there were real concessions on both sides, um, uh, especially under Omer, who I think deserves a lot of credit. Um, and I think both, what's interesting is that both Omer and Abbas are on record as believing that had they been able to negotiate for, mo for months, weeks, or, ev or months or even weeks longer, they could have perhaps reached an agreement. What I, frightens me about settlement growth is that it makes the possibility, it, it widens the division between these two perspectives, and it also radicalizes those, it also empowers those Palestinians who believe that Israel will never offer a Palestinian state, so the Palestinian answer should be to go for a one-state solution in which Israel doesn't exist at all. Yeah, you spoke about uh, two-state solutions, so... Uh, we see what happens in uh, Iraq and Syria, and there's an Arabic government there. Don't you think it's better for Arabs to live under Jewish government? It's in uh, safety-wise and money-wise. What do you think about that? Um, first of all, this may be, seem like a, just a strange terminological point, um, um, but I don't see the term Arab and Jew as um, mutually exclusive. As it happens, my own grandmother was born in Egypt, s spoke Arabic, she seems to me was an Arab and also a Jew. A large percentage of the Jewish population of Israel, of Israel are in fact people from Arabic countries, from Iraq, from, from Yemen, from Morocco, from Tunisia. Um, and I, I, I say this because if we are going to play the game in which we imagine that there are certain uh, uh, inherent cultural traits to Arabs, especially negative cultural traits to Arabs, then I think we, should, not, we would have to accept that if those exist for Arabs, they also exist for Arab Jews, um, um, who are, again, not quite 50% of the Jewish population in Israel, but fairly close to 50%. Um, I don't, it is true that the story in the, 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 post, the, the, the post-colonial story, the, the story since independence of the Arab world has been a pretty unhappy one. Um, it's also been pretty unhappy in large parts of southern, of sub-Saharan Africa. But I don't think the right answer to that is to suggest that people should remain under what is essentially colonial control, right? Um, the reason that Palestinians don't want to live under, the reason that, that I would call them Palestinians rather than Arabs because they define themselves as Palestinians, uh, the reason Palestinians don't want to live under Jewish control is because they want to be citizens of a country. Right now they live in, a, in the West Bank, they live in a country in which they are not citizens. Um, they don't have a passport. They want to be able to have the right to vote for the government that controls their lives. Right now, much of their lives is controlled by the Israeli government. The Israeli government controls the telecommunications spectrum. It controls whether you, can, whether you can travel to Jerusalem, whether you can travel from one part of the West Bank to the other, whether you can leave the West Bank or not. All these things are controlled by the Israeli government, and yet these people have no means of influence over the Israeli government. They live under military law. Very, very few people want that, even if you tell them that uh, uh, 500 miles away in some other country where people speak their same language, they got their own country and they really, really screwed it up. Most people are not likely to respond by saying, oh yeah, we could screw it up too. We'll simply remain without basic rights under the control of another country. Um, uh, it is entirely possible 
that Palestinians will make a hash of their independence. Um, uh, and, um, and I am, do not suggest that a Palestinian state poses no risks for Israel. It does pose risks for Israel. It does. Um, but you have to weigh the risks that a Palestinian state poses to Israel against the risks of permanent Israeli control over millions of people who lack basic rights. I think we can say with a very high degree of confidence that permanent control or indefinite control over millions of people who lack basic rights is a recipe for violence and instability because people will not simply sit back forever and accept that subjugation of basic rights, nor would we in their circumstances. Right now, the problem that Israel, fa and it's also important to remember that Israel today relies on the Palestinian Authority as a kind of subcontractor in the West Bank. When Israeli, since the end of the, since the, the Oslo Accords, Israelis have not had their own 18 and 19 year olds daily patrolling every Palestinian village and town in the West Bank. After the first intifada, it became clear to Israelis that the cost of doing that was simply too high. So the great benefit for Israel of the Oslo Accords is that it created a Palestinian authority that did a lot of Israel's dirty work for it. So, is, so Palestinian soldiers could be doing that, 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 um, that patrolling. Israel can call the Palestinian Authority and say, we think there's a terrorist there, please go get them on our behalf. So Israel is relying today on a kind of Palestinian subcontractor to prevent Palestinian terrorism. The problem is that that Palestinian subcontractor has lost all legitimacy among the Palestinian people. Because from the Palestinian perspective, the Palestinian Authority was meant to get them towards statehood. It was not meant to be Israel's permanent subcontractor of Israeli control. So in a Palestinian state, you're going to be relying on a Palestinian state to try to prevent terrorism against Israelis, uh, just as you are relying on the Palestinian Authority to do so now. But at least with a Palestinian state, people will have something to lose. They will have a state of their own. They will have the rights and dignity that comes with statehood. They may have some measure of economic prosperity, which I think will actually be very much in Israel's security interest because it will mean that pal the, danger, the most dangerous thing, and this is actually something that Israel's own chief of military intelligence said a couple weeks ago in, exp in talking about the recent terrible violence. He said, one of the most dangerous things for us is that we have a generation of Palestinians who have grown up who have nothing to lose. That's a very dangerous situation for Israel. Rational accord. That's a great question. So thank you for asking about Hamas. Um, so, um, uh, as I said, one of the reasons that one of the most disturbing, some of the most disturbing conversations I've ever had on, on this question of Israeli-Palestinian conflict have been with Palestinians who have said to me in, in complete sincerity that they believe that Israel supports Hamas. Now, uh, partly they say that because Israel, back in the late 1980s when Hamas was being created, Israel to some degree did favor Hamas against the PLO, um, thinking that Hamas wrongly would be more, more moderate, which of course it was not. But another big part of the reason that they think Israel supports Hamas, as crazy as that sounds to us, is they believe that Israeli policy has in fact strengthened Hamas. They, they say, look at a guy like, they, they say when, when Hamas shoots rockets at Israel, Israel then makes concessions to Hamas. When, it, when they kidnapped Gilad Shalit, Israel gave them 1,000 prisoners. When, usually when there's Palestinian rocket fire in a war, Israel loosens the blockade on Gaza. But Palestinians will say things like, what did Israel ever do for Salam Fayyad? Salam Fayyad, who was Israel's favorite prime minister ever, I mean, if you look at the interview that Salam Fayyad did with Roger Cohen, when he, when he resigned as prime minister. Now, Fayyad had a lot of Palestinian opponents, too. I'm not saying that Israel was his only problem. But he gave this quote in which he basically said, um, I committed myself to nonviolence and to institution building, and what we got was more and more settlement growth. And as a result, Palestinians think that Ham are more likely to think that Hamas's way is the better way. Um, so part of the answer is that it is within Israel's power, I think, to weaken Hamas and strengthen those Palestinians who do support a two-state solution and are willing to act nonviolently. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of Israel's actions have, been, have actually been in the opposite direction. Now, that doesn't entirely answer the question, though, because Hamas still exists. So here would be my answer. If Hamas takes violent action, if they shoot rockets at Israel, I happened to be in Israel with my daughter a couple summers ago when they, when they did so, Israel has every, 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 every right to respond 
as it should, defending its own country. And in fact, it's not only Hamas who takes those violent actions, Islamic Jihad does it, sometimes even Fatah uh, militias also take those violent actions. Um, but I believe that Hamas has the right to run in Palestinian elections even though it does not support the two-state solution, even though it does not accept the, the existence of Israel as a state within any borders. Uh, the reason I believe that Hamas has the right to run in elections even though it rejects the two-state, Palestinian elections even though it rejects the two-state solution, is that Israel allows its own political parties to run in its elections even though they don't support the two-state solution. One such party is Likud, Although Benjamin Netanyahu in 2009 said he supported the two-state solution, the Likud party has never endorsed the two-state solution. The last time it had a platform in which it took a position, it was explicitly against a two-state solution. So how does Israel get around that? What Netanyahu has said is, although Likud does not support the two-state solution, if there is a negotiated agreement, there will be a referendum among Israelis, and Likud will ab abide by the will of the Israeli people in a referendum. That is the standard, I believe, to which we should hold Hamas. Hamas should not, we don't need to demand that Hamas is a political party accept the two-state solution as a, a, as, uh, in order to run in Palestinian elections. What we should demand is that Hamas publicly say that if there is a negotiated agreement and there is a referendum among the Palestinians and the Palestinians vote for it, that Hamas will accept the will of the Palestinian people. The Ham a couple of Hamas leaders have actually said that, although they've said it casually in interviews and they've also said lots of other kinds of stuff. So I think it's very important to pressure Hamas to say that publicly in some kind of official way. If they agree to accept the will of the Palestinians as expressed in a referendum, as Likud has agreed to accept the will of the Israeli people, then I believe they have the right to run in Palestinian elections even though they don't support the two-state solution. But I think there are things that Israel could do to dramatically increase the chances that Hamas loses. And perhaps the most significant thing of all, actually, that Israel could do, uh, interestingly enough, if you really wanted to maximize the chances that Hamas would lose, um, would be to let Marwan Barghouti out of jail. Because the polls show that Barghouti is by far the most popular Palestinian leader. He is a, a leader of Fatah. As recently as 2013, he said he saw no alternative to the two-state solution. Um, uh, and yet he's been languishing in Israeli jail for decades now. Now, I'm not saying Israel put him there for no reason. I mean, he was definitely involved in violent actions during the Second Intifada. There's no question about that. But if you want to have, the problem Israel has is that Israel says, well, Abbas isn't really legitimate because he doesn't represent all the Palestinians. You can't have a legitimate leader who represents all the Palestinians unless you have elections. Uh, so I think the best thing for Israel to do would be to support elections, America support elections, allow Hamas to run on the proviso that they respect the will of the Palestinian people in a referendum. And then if you want to let Marwan Barghouti out of jail, you have a significantly more popular Fatah leader than Mahmoud Abbas to run against Hamas. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the work that you've been doing for these many years. I, oh, I count on yours as a very important voice in uh, American uh, Jewish response to, to Israel. Um, and in your writings over the last couple of years, what I've noted was a call for a freedom summer in, uh, in the West Bank mm -hmm. for uh, um, American Jews to play a, a part in these generations like uh, those did in earlier generations. And also your support of a, uh, uh, of a boycott of, of those goods that are produced in the West Bank uh, right. I itself. Yeah. Um, one of the th one of the ways that you phrase this that I think is very useful. I I, I teach and I work with many many uh, young Jews who are very bright and very engaged in their twenties and thirties, uh, who count themselves as anti-Zionists. I do not. I'm I, I find my position more with yours, um, and I am trying to. Uh, I guess what I would ask you to do here, if you would, is to elaborate a little bit on the ways that. American Jews can act in grassroots ways to help build American, uh, help build Israeli democracy and oppose the occupation. Uh, the, the Freedom Summer idea and the boycott of the West Bank being two of them, but can sure. you expound on your current thinking on those things? Sure, sure. So there are a number of things that I think American Jews could do. Um, one um, of, of the things we could do, which wasn't among the things that you mentioned, but I think is very important, is that American Jews could, when we go to Israel, could actually interact with Palestinians. Um, 
Right now, we send lots of young American Jewish kids on birthright, which is terrific. I think it's wonderful that American Jewish kids have the right to go to Israel and go to the Kotel and go to the beaches in Tel Aviv and have all kinds of great experiences with Israeli soldiers. Um, but um, but they're, they're not really seeing all of Israel. 50% of the people under Israeli control, if you, can, if you include Palestinian citizens of Israel, quote unquote, Israeli Arabs, with the West Bank and Gaza, 50% of the people in Israel are Palestinian. So if you want to have a real experience of Israel, you need to have an interaction, a real interaction with Palestinians. It's kind of like going to my hometown of New York and spending your time in the Upper East Side uh, uh, or the Upper West Side and never going north you know, of 96th Street, right? If you want to have a, not a disney experience, but a real experience, you need to have some experience of all the people who live in this area. Now, that can be a troubling experience. It's not an easy experience. But I think that if we want to create, uh, you know, Israel means struggle. We, shouldn't, we, we should want our, our children to have a loving struggle with Israel, the same thing we want them to have with Judaism, right? Not, not an unquestioning support based on never looking in the dark places, right? But, um, but a sense of commitment and a sense of, of struggle, um, uh, even if that requires asking difficult, painful questions. Um, and I think that, you know, if I've seen this time and time again, uh, a relatively brief period of time spent with Palestinians, um, Palestinians who, lo and behold, don't actually wake up every morning uh, chomping at the bit to kill Jews just for the sake of it. Um, Palestinians who actually, in personal interactions, are surprisingly reminiscent of ourselves, um, you know, uh, who talk about what it's like to have lived for their entire lives um, without the basic rights that we take for granted. Um, with, uh, without the right to travel freely, without the right to due process. Um, these are very uh, transformational experiences, i found, for many, many people. They're wonderful organizations. There's a wonderful organization called Encounter, for instance, which takes American, Jewish, uh, American Jews into the West Bank to meet with Palestinians in Hebron and Bethlehem, including right, you know, very right-of-center American, American Jews. Um, just not to say that their minds need to change, but to simply say, we talk about Palestinians constantly as American Jews. And I think there's something pathological about constantly talking about people without ever talking to them. It's a kind of recipe for dehumanization. And beyond that, I think that if you want to counter anti-Semitism among Palestinians, and there is a lot of anti-Semitism among Palestinians, tragically, one of the best things you can do is to interact with Palestinians. Because while they are being humanized for you, you will be humanizing Jews for them. I had this amazing experience when I went, after I went to a village uh, in the West Bank called Nabi Saleh, where they've been doing nonviolent protests for a very long time, one of the places that I would love to see young American Jews go and participate. And this woman uh, said to me that she was in Washington advocating on the Palestinian, for the Palestinian cause, and she said she was going to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And uh, she said she was going to the Holocaust Museum in Washington in solidarity with the Israeli Jews who came to protest with her. Because she said, before they came, the only people we ever interacted with were soldiers and settlers. And the pe none of the people in our, very few of the people in our village, especially the younger people, right? Because young Palestinians now rarely cross into the Israel to work like older Palestinians did. Younger people had this uniformly negative view of, of Jews, not just Israelis, of Jews, which was completely upended once they actually started interacting with Jews. This, this woman also told me that she had interacted with some settlers somewhere outside her village, and the settler said, you know, you Palestinians, you're, you're, you're haters. You just hate all Jews. And she said, do you know that there's a, a Jewish person sleeping on my floor right now? My daughter is serving him breakfast, right? So I think these are the kind of interactions that can be very powerful to have. And this is why Hillel's limitations and the de facto limitations that exist at so many synagogues, Jewish community centers, uh, Jewish organizations, which basically say, no anti-Zionist can come and speak here, right? You ha the, the problem is that Palestinians are not Zionists, right? Um, uh, so it doesn't mean that they all want to blow up buses, but they're not Zionists. Zionism hasn't been a great experience for them, right? So, um, so these limitations that we have uh, de facto make it impossible for a synagogue to bring a Palestinian speaker in uh, and for that process to take place. So I think that's one thing that would be not so difficult that people could do. Um, um, more controversially, I also think that, um, and it's more difficult now, obviously, because of the violence, but I think there is a lot more nonviolent protest in the West Bank that, um, than, than American Jews tend to be aware of. And um, you often, I'm often dispirited when I hear 
people say, well, what if the Palestinians would simply protest nonviolently? Because the reality is, in places like Nabi Saleh and Belin, where they've been protesting nonviolently for years and years and years, that the response tends to be tear gas and, 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 and going to military courts. Um, and I think that if there were young American Jews who were there on the ground as part of that process, then word would get back to their parents and their rabbis about what happened. And this is what happened in Freedom Summer. This was the idea of Freedom Summer, that what was happening to blacks in Mississippi was not getting out to the country as a whole, but if you recruited white, many of them Jewish, college students to go down there, that would awaken the conscience of the country. I think if there were young American Jews at those protests, it would awaken the conscience of Jewish America. Um, I'll stop there. There are a bunch of other things that I've also talked about, and I'm happy to talk about them in future questions, but I just I have a tendency to go on long, so I have to, have to restrain myself on that. Uh, um, I was interacting with a Palestinian who happened to be um, a major in the Israeli army uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in Yorkshire in England, and he was explaining that when he decided to go into the IDF, he did it um, because he felt that he'd had a good education, he'd always lived in Israel, and he felt that he was, um, wh why should he accept all of this, health care, education, all the rest of it, and then not serve in the IDF like the rest of the Israelis? And subsequently, he was cut off by his entire village and family and everybody. He's risen to the rank of major, and now he's brought his parents and immediate family around. He's still ostracized by the rest of the village, and he knows that he never can marry a Muslim girl from his village. He's a Muslim soldier. But there's another side to this also, in that the um, Israeli Arabs go to school, they get free education, they get free health care, they go, and go to university without serving in the army for three years, so they're educate they're three years further on than, than their Jewish counterparts. And, and that seems highly unfair. And is it not true, I mean, I may be ignorant here, but is it not true that the Palestinians in the West Bank, if they chose to, they could also be Israeli Arabs with all of those, they could be part of Israel. They're, it's their choice not to. Um, uh, so are you, are you done? Is that, uh, I don't really want to cut you off. I, I just I wanted to, um, um, no, the last part is, is not correct. Um, Palestinians in East Jerusalem are Israeli are, are residents and can apply for Israeli citizenship. They're not, they're not born Israeli citizens, but they can apply for Israeli citizenship. But Palestinians in the West Bank outside of East Jerusalem cannot. Um, um, uh, it's true that uh, Israeli Arabs, uh, again, I call Palestinian citizens just because they now mostly call themselves Palestinian citizens, um, um, uh, uh, are citizens of Israel. They, they vote in Israeli elections. They are represented in the Knesset. There is a Palestinian on the Supreme Court. Um, they, uh, and, and I think those are all things that Israel can be proud of um, and should be proud of. Um, but um, you can be proud of that and still acknowledge that they suffer a kind of structural discrimination. In fact, the Israeli government itself, uh, in a report done by something called the Orr Commission in 2013, after, um, after some uh, riots by Palestinian citizens of Israel, which led to a bunch of them being shot, said that the Israeli pattern of uh, behavior, the government's pattern of behavior towards Palestinian citizens had been characterized by prejudice and neglect. There, there are a lot of different kinds of ways in which this plays itself out. Some of them are symbolic. So, so for instance, Israel has a Palestinian citizen on its Supreme Court, which I think is terrific, but that man does not stand for the flag or the national anthem. Now, he doesn't stand for the flag or the national anthem because the Hatikva, a song that I like quite a bit, um, uh, talks about Nefesh Yehudi, about the Jewish soul. So it doesn't speak to him, right? It's a, uh, um, uh, uh, the flag has a uh, Magin David on it, right? It's shaped like a talit. So these are symbols that for a Palestinian uh, uh, who's not Jewish don't resonate in the way that, Ju that they resonate for Jews. In a, more, in a more tangible way, the problem that Palestinian citizens of Israel face is that there has been a de facto understanding since Israel was created that when you're creating a government and you need a majority in the Knesset, you need 61 votes in the Knesset, you need to have a Jewish majority. 
which is to say that you cannot bring in Arab parties, Palestinian parties, to get to your Knesset majority. So Palestinian parties are not part of the horse trading that goes on. They are not represented in Israeli government coalitions, and therefore they naturally lose out in the distribution of government resources. Now, there are some questions, actually, about the degree to which Palestinian parties would uh, be willing to serve in cabinet positions, but uh, there would be, that would be a very divisive issue among Palestinian citizens, but they are not offered. Now, the rationale that's given is that they're not Zionists, and so therefore you can't, a political party can't be part of the Israeli governing coalition if it's not Zionist. But the Haredim, the, the, the ultra-Orthodox parties are also not Zionists, and they are always included, or at least offered to be in these governing coalitions. So these are some of the reasons that Palestinian citizens of Israel tend to find that the government spends substantially less on their uh, on, on education, on roads, on infrastructure for them. There's also, again, I won't go into more detail, there's also a significant problem that Arab Israelis, Palestinian citizens have with, with housing in Israel. Um, part, of, part of it is that Israeli land law was created pre-state, and much of the land is owned by the Israeli Land Authority um, and, is, and is designed for leasing to Jews. So it's very, very difficult for Palestinians to acquire land in Israel. I think that if this young man wants to serve in the, Israel, in the IDF, that's fine. Um, there are some Palestinians, particularly Druze, for instance, um, and some Bedouin who do, who do serve. Um, but I think we can be at least uh, somewhat, somewhat understanding of why Palestinians might not want to serve in the IDF. After all, the Palestinians in the West Bank, the, 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 the people over whom the Israeli Defense Forces control, the people who the Israeli Defense Forces control, the people who live under military law without basic rights, are their cousins, right? They, they, they are their brethren. Uh, and so being part of an, of an Israeli army that is overseeing that occupation, that's hard for some left-wing Israeli Jews. But it would be very particularly difficult for Israeli Palestinians, which is, I think, why some people have suggested that at least at this stage, the best answer might be a form of national service for Israeli Palestinian citizens, in which they had an option of, of a way in which they could serve their country without actually serving in the IDF. You began by talking about what American Jews understand, are willing to allow for and what political positions American Jews are taking and went into very nuanced discussion about relationships between real people in real time. It seems to me that what you've said is, in short, it's complicated. It takes a lot of patience and that American Jews would need to be both patient and persistent, and taking stands which are unpopular and require explanation in a time in which that's not popular in American politics. Don't bother me with facts. I believe in the flag. How do you help to, how do we help to address that? in this country before we even get to Israel? Yeah, well, um, uh, we have a lot of our own problems um, uh, here, needless to say. Um, and, and I think it's important to say that and recognize that. And I'm always very conscious when I'm speaking to Israeli audiences that um, as an American, um, I have to have a fair, a lot of humility um, uh, about, um, there are a lot of, there are problems that Israel has that America doesn't have. Um, like holding millions of people without citizenship under its control. But Israel, since its very founding, has given everyone the right to health insurance, um, right? Something that we still haven't quite managed in the United States after all these hundreds of years. Um, uh, I, I guess I think in terms of, um, without venturing into Donald Trump and all that, because that would be a whole other conversation, I would just say, in terms of our community, um, I think we, we have a very problematic dynamic. The problematic dynamic is that um, the level of vitriol around the Israel conversation is so great that it leads many people to just not want to engage with it at all. I think it's especially true among younger people. Um, and there is a sense among um, some younger people that if they question, um, uh, uh, certainly question beyond a certain level, 
that they will suffer some a form of a certain kind of excommunication. Um, uh, uh, that that it's ironic for many uh, young American Jews to point out the irony that you know they were raised to believe that one of the things that's being great about Jew being Jewish is that everyone is always arguing. Um, but that uh, you know that you can even go into most synagogues in the United States and tell the rabbi you don't believe in God, and he'll just say you know keep coming to shul, you know. Um, uh, it won't be a terribly big problem, right? But if you come and say, you know, I, I disagree with Israeli policy or, or I don't believe in the idea of Israel as a Jewish state, which you were hearing from some younger American Jews, then, that's, then there's a sense of kind of a rift between you and the community and oftentimes even within families. And it's, so we, we have an increasing generational divide because of the experience of younger American Jews is very different. They've grown up with less anti-Semitism in the United States. They've grown up with less uh, seeing Israel as a very powerful country rather than remembering Israel being on the verge of, of destruction. They've also seen almost no Jews flee anti state-sponsored anti-Semitic persecution and go to Israel. So they don't necessarily understand why Israel is a safe haven, a refuge, as intuitively as older American Jews are. Um, and we also have an increasingly profound divide between religious and secular American Jews. As the Orthodox population grows and grows, um, and the population of American Jews who are totally unaffiliated grow and grow. And these are two communities that, uh, that don't interact with one another very, very often. So I think, you know, the challenge is, I think, and it's not easy, but I think the challenge is um, to, to care about this issue enough to continue to learn about it and continue to actually argue your position about it and try to make change, um, but also to recognize that we are one community and we have to remain one community and we can't become aliens from one another. And so that even though we may have very fierce arguments about this, and believe me, I, I have, have been in many, many very fierce arguments about this, um, uh, it's also very, very important to try to find ways of affirming that despite these profound divisions, we are one people, and we have more that, that, that unites us than, than separates us. Um, and so we need to find ways. I'm afraid that there is not going to be, to the degree that Israel was ever a unifying consensus view in American Jewish life, I think it is not now and will not be in the future, which I think it makes it all the more important for us to think creatively about how to find ways of American Jews of connecting to one another who disagree about Israel because, in fact, that has the potential, I think the very dangerous potential, of ripping our community apart.